Hello there, Dominic Herbst here with Restoring Relationships. And just a reminder, we just kicked off our next prodigal spouse and divorce recovery Zoom last evening at 7 to 8.30 Eastern Time. There's still time to come in, uh, but I want to tell you, we have a tremendous group as large as any we've ever had. You know what's most encouraging is that people that have been on previous Zooms of this theme have continually come back through because they they're sensing that the power of God and the invocation of his presence in these uh, active Zooms that they are uh, gleaning wisdom that they didn't get before more and more. Plus, oftentimes the enemy will steal the truth and the imprint of that truth is such it's just echoing off their minds and their hearts giving them the chance now to obey the truth. Because remember, when we're awakened to truth, it lets us know where we need the touch of Christ the most. But until we walk in it, we can't be set free from that difficult place, that darkness that we're talking about right now. So remember, to awaken, to read the word, to hear the word, awakens us to the truth. But until we walk in it, we won't be set free by that same truth. So we want to encourage you and anything you're listening to here right now, and also encouraging you to look at uh, Walking Through Calvary. There's still time to get into this one, but we will actually be announcing our very next one coming up. It's going to be a weekend one. You're going to be able to get through the whole thing in two and a half days uh, on a particular weekend coming up soon. So uh, we, we invite you to join us. Now to the topic right here, a prayer to overcome the darkness holding my loved one captive. You've heard about the, the darkness that comes from, the, from Satan himself, from the darkness of evil and the wickedness in this world. And I want to show you several areas where Jesus has come in order to not only pre, to bring the gospel, to set us free from the, uh, from the sin, the condemnation of sin, uh, which comes uh, as a result of to preach the gospel. And I often go to this place where he is preaching in the synagogue uh, in uh, Luke 4, 18. There are five proclamations that Jesus makes out of Isaiah 61, chapter 61. So he's reading out of the Old Testament, but he's actually reading script that's coming into the New Testament in the book of Luke, chapter 4, verse 18. So he is fulfilling that. And that's what he's saying today. This scripture is fulfilled. He said, I, meaning Jesus, have come to preach the gospel to the poor. Poor in spirit, that means not poor with regard to, to money or uh, material things. Poor in spirit, knowing I have a spirit that is dead and trespasses in sin. The next four proclamations are upon, that need, we need to be set free of are there because of darkness. So the whole topic here is to, how do I get my loved ones set free from the darkness? Maybe you're in the darkness right now too. How do I get set free from the darkness? And if, if you remember, the four proclamations are, I've come to give sight to the blind. Well, there's nothing more dark than a man or a woman who's blind in their eyes. But this refers to blind in the mind. But this blindness is spiritual blindness meaning that the enemy has capability of blinding you and me from the very things that are holding us captive. So whenever one is blind, it's the darkness of their mind that's unable to see and perceive what God wants them to see so they can be set free. When one is bound, he said, I came to set the captives free. And he, when one is bound or held captive within their heart, it's the darkness holding them captive. It's not the light. It's not the truth. It's the darkness always that keeps them blind and keeps you and I blind when we're not careful and not asking the Lord to check our spirit, to search us. As David said in Psalm 139, search me, O God, know my thoughts, try me, know my heart, see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I perceive something is missing. I'm, I, I, I know something is there, but I don't know what it is. I can't see it. I'm blind. Now search me because in the blindness I'm bound. So when you're blind and you're bound, it's always the darkness, always. When one is oppressed, it's the darkness of depression and many, many other things that come with oppression. If you want to know what fills up the psychology uh, 
the people that are in the field of psychology, therapy, and counseling, it is the oppressed people that come in to see them. So it, it covers a whole canopy of what? Darkness over the person's mind and heart. It's the darkness of depression among every other type of disorder that that person may be held captive by. So this darkness can come in the form of a stronghold of depression. And if you've experienced it like I did years ago until I was set free of it, depression is a sensation of nothing but darkness all around me that I can't even see my way out. And it's bigger than me because it's a power greater than me, but it's enemy power. It's not Christ power. Now, we always like to quote, greater is he that is in me, Christ. If you're a believer in Christ, he's in you. Then he that is in the world, but he's getting too close, the enemy, and he's now bringing this darkness to bring about depression, despondency, fear, anxiety, where you're constantly nervous. The Bible calls it an Old Testament word, vexation, to be vexed. That is constantly in turmoil and constantly in distress. Even when nothing is coming to get you, no one's coming to get you, you're in distress because you know it's just a matter of time. This is what darkness does. It creates a sense where the person feels like they need to run, 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 and get away and get away, but there's no one pursuing. It actually, you know, the Bible says, and I think it's a proverb that says, the wicked flee when no man pursueth. And you might say, but wait a minute, if the person's in darkness, are they really wicked? They're under wickedness. That's you, me. We may be blood-bought, born again by Christ in us, but when the darkness settles over us, we are operating in a realm that is nothing but wicked. That doesn't mean we're practicing wickedness. However, if we don't uh, look to the Christ to get our way out, because he is the only pathway out, to believe that we can go to a fallen human being and somehow have them lead us out. Now, you may say, well, I've been to counselors and they've helped me get through some of this. I am so happy to hear that, but have you been set free? There's a difference between getting alleviated to the impact of that darkness where you feel the presence of that person who stands in the gap, and God will use that. That's a very good gift of a believer, trusting that they're believers in Christ because they have no hope or help for you yeah, on the basis of the word of truth, that they're not believers in Christ and they're not obedient to the truth. They can only take you so far. And it's almost as if there's all kinds of places and lands in that darkness surrounding that person that is held captive by that darkness. But the problem is you can go to any, any, any uh, 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 place where that border of the darkness is, but you're not going to get through it by some human fallen element. It has to be the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit. All power is given to him in heaven and in earth. You're gonna hear that through this whole time so that you don't forget it. All power, not some power, not great power. The greatest of all power, all power. So we now know that the four proclamations that Jesus made in Luke 4, 18, quoting out of Isaiah 61, are all the result of the darkness settling over those, first of all, unbelievers, and then believers who now have come to the knowledge of the truth to be cleansed by the blood of Christ, cleansed, their sin cleansed. Now it's time for them to have the blindness removed from their mind so that they can see the enemy, perceive the enemy, know when he's attacking, know when he's crouching at the door, and then to ask the Lord Jesus Christ to deliver you and I or them from captivity, from being held captive by the stronghold, and then being led out of the darkness so that the spirit of oppression has to leave us, that darkness of oppression and depression within the soul, feeling the sensation of death. Remember, darkness is always equated with death and light, the light of Christ is always uh, equated with light or life. The life is the light of man, John 1. And in him was life, meaning Jesus. And the life was the light of men. So Jesus is perfect light. There's no darkness in him and the enemy is, is complete darkness. So we don't want any part of that. Those, for instance, experiencing oppression, which is the number one reason for all the psychological disorders and the need for intervention, again, from a human process. Be careful of the limitations of human psychology. Well, but there's Christian psychologists. I understand that. 
I'm a Christian psychologist, but hear this, using psychological methods, when the Christ of Christianity is the only one that can set that counselee, that client free, it is a blind guide, even as a believer, a blind guide not to uh, present to them the authority of Jesus Christ and teach them to take that authority over any area where the enemy has held them captive in his darkness that will bind that darkness in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, cast it out, show the origin why that darkness is settled in, repent for any area that has not been surrendered into the throne room of God. I repent from not trusting you, God. I repent from this sin that has allowed the darkness to come into me. And you may say, well, what, what if my loved one, they're not, they're not even looking to God, then you pray in intercession that God would do whatever he needs to do, whatever is required as the number one intercessor in that loved one's life. You're the number one intercessor. Why? You have the most to, to, to uh, lose in terms of the fellowship of that one you love so dearly, and you're probably the worst victim of their behavior because when they're in darkness, they're doing nothing but casting dark shrouds over the people around them. You know what, what happens when you're in the presence of someone covered in darkness. You feel like the darkness is getting on you, getting over you, penetrating you. You've got to protect yourself when you're in the presence of someone who's bringing that darkness. That darkness is more powerful than you in your human flesh, not more powerful than the Christ that is in you. You must invoke the Christ. It is not enough to have people just giving encouragement and you can do this and all of that. That all sounds good, but ultimately until you take, you bring forth the spirit of God into the spiritual realm where this spiritual darkness is, it will not depart. It's not going to give up without a fight. It's the enemy's way of cloaking that person in that shroud that I call it. I mean, you want to talk about a whole shroud, a whole bubble around that person that's a shroud. You know what a shroud is. It covers dead bodies. There's nothing under the shroud but death. And that's what the person feels and experiences. Never forget that darkness is death. Light is life. So um, here's a definition from Webster. It's unjust or cruel exercise of authority or power. This is an example of oppression of a people under a dictator or a people group under communism. They're, they're not free. They're not free. I mean, there are certain things that they may be able to do, but they ultimately don't belong to themselves. They don't have the freedom of this country. And this is why it's so, it's so important to protect that freedom. Freedom always has a price. So oppression can be a people group that keep others enslaved or oppressed. Oppression is just another word for keeping people enslaved, sometimes by fear. The fear that the authorities of the dictatorship are going to imprison them or even kill them and their families. But oppression can also be oppression over the soul. And that begins with depression, despondency, suicidal thoughts, and ideation. That includes fear, anxiety, even panic attacks. I experienced all of that, but Christ set me free. I didn't even know about the power of this darkness that would come over even the believer. I didn't know. I was a believer at the time, but I never knew that I could invoke the power of the living Christ through the omnipotent power of his spirit, where all power, all authority, he says, is given to me in heaven and in earth, in the whole universe, all power, not some, not most, all. You're going to keep hearing that. Don't ever lose it because it's the one thing that will stop you from going to everyone else on the horizontal plane and start going in and up on the vertical plane. You say, but, but, but I need somebody to help me with that. That's what the enemy is going to tell you. You need to surrender into him. It's not about you helping him. God doesn't need your help. He wants your surrender. He wants your obedience. He wants your trust. That's it. It's, a, it, it. it's the one place where you give up to win. Have you ever been told in any sport, any competition, hey, give up, you'll win. No, that's totally counterintuitive to the natural world. You, you don't, in the natural world, you're playing a sport, you go, you give it at all and you win. But in the realm of the spirit, you give up to win because the one who fights the battle for you is the one who has all the power. The battle, the spiritual battle of getting rid of this darkness belongs to the Lord. The battle belongs to the Lord, whether it's in you or your loved one. 
So stop trying to fight this in the natural realm. Stop trying to reason it out or reason it into the one who's taken over with darkness. That's like trying to reason cancer out of a man's body. Would even natural medicine ever relegate to the fact that, hey, we've got the scans here. We know where your cancer is. We're going to teach you how to talk your way out of not having cancer. That's outrageous. Time for a new doctor, right? It needs to be cleansed and purified out of you. The cancer has to. That's why we go to a physician on this earth. Now, I recognize some of the methods of eradicating that cancer might be as invasive as anything could ever be, but it's what we have in order to get it out of there. Well, in the realm of darkness, a bitter root will come with this, a contempt. Not only will you be blind, you start to lose sight of who you are in Christ. Not just who you are, but whose you are. Never forget, it's not just who you are. A believer in Christ, it's whose you are. You belong to him. And he is ready to unleash if you ask him, if you appeal to him, if you take authority in the spiritual realm. Jesus said, you receive not because you ask not. Start asking. He wants to give it to you. He's given you free will. He's not playing some cosmic game here. He gave you free will so that you know that if you trust him, if you obey him, if you surrender to him, remember, give up to win or give yourself fully to him that he will wow you in ways that you never imagine. And if it's the loved one who's so held captive, they can't even form the words of prayer. You go into a high velocity authority. Get prayer warriors, agree with them. Remember, if any two agree as to touching anything here on earth, it will be done in heaven. What is bound on earth is bound in heaven. I bind this darkness over my husband, my wife, my son, my daughter, my loved one. Whatsoever is lucid on earth is lucid in heaven. I loosen this, this soul, this spirit of God, this, this precious one of my family members. I loosen their heart to have the fullness of reception of the Holy Spirit and that the light of Christ will pierce that darkness and dis disintegrate it, that it can no longer be there. Lord will give you the words. We're going to make sure we pray here at the end of this presentation. And this oppression also includes a sense of being weighed down in the body of my, our mind. You ever felt that weight? That's why Jesus said, and it's in Matthew 11, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's talking about the weight upon the soul of a person that is never meant to carry a weight of that nature, but we keep taking on more and more and we carry it and it begins to crush us and break us to that we come to the point saying, I can't do this. And that's the perfect place to be. You say, no, I got to be strong. No, not in this place, not strong in flesh. You don't want strong flesh because that flesh will never come up against even the, the slightest of demonic influences. It's only the power of Christ that will take authority and disperse the enemy in the darkness. That's so important that we understand that. Jesus said this so that you would remember to trust him. My strength, Jesus said, my strength is perfected in your weakness. In other words, when you're weak in the flesh and any attempts on your part to do what you think you should do, when you're weak, I am strong. Actually, I am strongest through you. Don't get in my way. If you try to do this and be my little helper, you get in my way. Everything you touch as a fallen human being and your methods and your ways, you contaminate what God intends to do in the perfect, in the realm of the spirit because he wants to bring his perfect truth, his perfect life and his perfect light to pierce that darkness. Spiritual darkness is the state of a person who is living apart from God. Right there it is. I got this again from gotquestions.org. gotquestions.org, give them the credit. They did the research here. The verses were most important to me because I come from the truth. You know that, not opinions. So that means anyone who's under spiritual darkness, whether they fell into it or whether they drifted into it or whether it came upon them like a thief in the night, and this is a person living apart from God. They cannot live or do the will of God while they're under the darkness. They can't. As a matter of fact, they're going to do the very opposite. You think about this with leaders of our nations. They're living under this belief that they have the answers when in fact they're under darkness. Their minds are blind by the enemy. 
And this is what it means in the scriptures in Romans, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. They think they're wise, but they weren't. It's just like you said to the Pharisees, they thought they were so religiously connected with the living God. They couldn't have been farther from God. They were under the darkness of the blindness. They couldn't even, they couldn't even discern the Messiah when they were looking right at him. That's darkness. That's pride. That's arrogance. They couldn't even perceive him. And when Jesus confronted them in John 8, 44, don't ever forget this. You're of your father, the devil. Imagine that. He called the top religious leaders of his day. He called them children of the devil. You're of the, your father, the devil. He was a murderer from the beginning and a liar and the father of lies. And the truth is not even in him. When he speaks, he speaks of lies. He speaks of himself, the father of lies. That's what he said to them. Imagine being a believer and being lost in the darkness and now doing the things of the father, the devil. That father, not this one. Our father is Abba, Romans 8, 15. We no longer have the spirit of bondage again to fear. We have the spirit, capital S, of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father, Abba. He wants, he's not only our Abba, Father, he's our great physician. Remember the earthly physicians that come to help eradicate the cancer in the body? We need our great physician to eradicate the cancer of the darkness that's around us and through us, because it's in that darkness you're gonna find that there's a root of bitterness. There's a place where you will have relegated or your loved one will have gone to a place where they have long stopped trusting in themselves and they have trusted in the enemy, not realizing, it, thinking that they have devised a method by which they will come out of that darkness and they go deeper in. It's a big mirage. It's a ruse to get them in greater captivity. So this is a spiritual battle. Once again, it belongs to the Lord. Stop making this battle for that precious loved one on your hands, on your head, on your actions. No, you don't want your actions. Don't trust yourself. You're the one that has the light. You're the one that's gonna be held accountable on the basis of what you do or not do. So you need to be fully surrendered, as I do. You need to be fully in trust to the word of God and his will. You need to be fully obedient to his word and his will. So as we walk through this, now we see that the Old Testament book of Isaiah, when it was prophesied about the Messiah coming, speaks of a deep spiritual darkness that enveloped the people. This is hundreds of years before Christ came. This darkness has been here since before man was created. It was Satan and that the, 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 the minions that were cast out with him. One third of all the heavenly hosts cast out to the darkness of this earth. And the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. This is the coming of the Christ. Have seen a great light. Notice the description, a great light on those living in the land of deep darkness. A light has dawned. Imagine what the world was like when that occurred, when Christ came. It's prophesied. Go all the way back to Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2. It's an amazing thing about hundred year, hundreds and hundreds of year old prophecies that came through our prophets where the Holy Spirit of God breathed through them and they, they spoke what God told them to speak. They didn't even know and understand what they were speaking in some cases. <clears throat> this passage reappears in the New Testament in Matthew 4, verse 16 to announce that those who have come to know the God of Israel through his son, Jesus Christ, are the ones who have been delivered from spiritual darkness and now walk in the light of God's life. When we come to Christ, we've been delivered from the darkness. So how to creep in again? How to get there? How to get in my loved one? So we've got to invoke the spiritual light. And there's only one, and that's the light of Christ, the Holy Spirit. The Apostle John taught that God is light. <clears throat> this is the message we heard from Jesus and now declare to you, God is light and there is no darkness in him at all. There's no darkness in Christ. That's why in the heavenly realm for eternity, there'll be no more darkness. There'll be no more tears. And the shining face of the Christ will be like the sun. <laughs> and that will be the light of day and night. Oh, there won't be night. <laughs> there'll be no more night. 
the people walking in darkness and because the, uh, a light has dawned. The passage reappears in the New Testament to announce that those who have come to know the God of Israel through his son, Jesus Christ, are the ones who have been delivered from spiritual darkness and now walk in the light of God's life. So we have to create the pathway for the loved one to walk out of that darkness. But it's got to be through the power of God and only the power of God in the form of his Holy Spirit in Christ Jesus, because he's the one that finished the battle on Calvary. When he said it is finished, he finished the defeat of sin, the defeat of Satan, and all that are part of Satan's kingdom. And death, death was, oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? When a person is approaching death, they feel the shadow of the darkness. But to a believer, it's but a shadow. Passing from this light, life and light, into the next. And so shall they ever be with the Lord. So the apostle taught that God is light. And there is no darkness in him at all. Thus, spiritual darkness means not having fellowship with God through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, you say, but my loved one is a believer. They have a relationship. So is it possible to have the darkness overcome them to the point that they will operate as if they have no relationship with Christ? Yes. Notice what I said. I didn't say that the relationship would be rendered null and void. I said that it will have no influence over their behavior or over what they do. They're not walking in the light. How can they be influenced by the Holy Spirit if they're not walking in the light? So this is the attempt, this is the desire of the enemy when he loses us to Christ to let that shroud of darkness descend upon them in such a way that they're held captive for a long time, even till death do they part. No, you speak against it. You make the proclamations into the throne room and you say, no, I proclaim on the behalf of my loved one, O God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, this battle belongs to you. I will not touch it because no flesh will glory in your presence. I will not get in your way. You will not share your glory with any man or any woman. And I don't want to get in your way. And I'm going to make these proclamations because life and death is in the power of the tongue. And I will speak into the throne room. I will speak no matter how much hope I feel is lost. Every time I see him or her cloaked in that darkness, I will hope against hope, as Abraham said, that I have no hope. I will still hope on the basis of the promises of you, O oh God, to deliver them from this darkness. So thus spiritual darkness means that they won't have a relationship. It'll look like that. God's going to change that. The darkness of separation from God is overcome through Christ. In him was life. And that life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness comprehends it not. The darkness cannot overcome the light ever. But we must invoke the light in our prayer and in our intercession. The spiritual darkness uh, from, from the moment Adam and Eve sinned, humans have lived in a fallen world. All people are born in the fallen state of the separation from God. Every child born into this world, before they become a believer, their spirit is dead in trespasses and sin. It's dark. It's, remember, death is darkness. Darkness is death. It's dark. And only the light of Christ coming in when they receive Christ can cleanse them from the sin that has kept the spirit dark and held hostage, held in bondage. And this is why, um, and this is why it's regarded as living in rebellion. Living in rebellion to God and his will is equivalent to living in spiritual darkness. So whenever you see a believer, or you as a believer, you're living in rebellion and you know that you're doing sin, you are actually invoking the darkness upon you. You're bringing a darkness to you, even though the light is in you. That darkness cannot extinguish the light of Christ, but what it will do to you is it will extinguish your fellowship with and the communion with God that you so desperately need to walk after the spirit. So this is a very powerful spiritual battle that needs to be reckoned with with the most utmost gravity of seriousness here. So he has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And we've been rescued. Jesus Christ has rescued us. 
Colossians 1, 13. Those who reject Jesus Christ face eternal separation from God in a blackened darkness. How does darkness get more than black? How does blackness get more than dark? And that's Jude 1, verses 4 through 13, okay? Uh, in Judaism, a person's inner character and moral quality are understood to be reflected through his eyes. And you can tell a lot. The eyes are the windows of the soul. It's been said. Jesus compares the moral condition of an unregenerated soul to darkness. A lot of people, you can see the darkness in their eyes. You can even see darkness come over a believer in such a way that you know there's an area there that the enemy wants to increase that darkness in them for an area where they are still held captive and have not been set free. So the Apostle Paul describes those in a sinful state before knowing Christ as possessing a darkened, closed mind and a hardened heart. Can it get any worse than that? A darkened and closed mind, a mind that cannot receive truth, and a hardened heart. Their minds are full of darkness, according to Ephesians 4.18. They wander far from the life of God gives them, and they have closed their minds, hardened their hearts against him. Unbelievers live in a spiritual darkness because Satan, the God of this world, small g, has blinded their minds. That's in 2 Corinthians 4, 3, and 4. I remember looking at that verse and quoting it year after year when it was appropriate. If our gospel be hid, Paul's talking to the church of Corinth. If our gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to cleanse us from sin, if it be hid, it is hid to those that are lost. Because the God of this world, small g, Satan, because the God of this world hath blinded their eyes, lest the light of the glorious gospel of peace shine in. So the enemy keeps heathen, keep people that don't know Christ and have thus far rejected Christ, keeps a very thick darkness around their mind, a spiritual darkness that the eyes of their mind cannot see that they're in darkness. And this is, again, goes back to leaders who do not allow the sovereignty of God to rule in their lives, so they will not allow the sovereignty and the great wisdom of God to be part of their ruling decisions, which is why if you look at this, the decisions of those in leadership without Christ, measure them against the truth. Measure them against the truth. They're completely diametrically opposed, 100% diametrically opposed because the spiritual realm is counterintuitive to anything in the natural realm. And what they think they're doing works and is right. All they're doing is creating devastation upon devastation because everything they touch, they contaminate. They're filled with the darkness in their soul. If they don't know Christ, it can't get worse than that. And that is why when we put leaders in a, uh, in a government where we make the choices in leadership that even if we don't like the people that make the decisions that follow the truth, when we put the dark ones in leadership, that's a ruse of the enemy to hijack the wisdom of the believer, to put somebody of that nature in because they happen to like them better. Man, there's too much at stake here, folks. You gotta be really, really, really careful. Look at what is done, what they do. If it's biblical, even if they're wretched and they're bullies and they're, they're uh, just... You know, people you only be around. Who are we? We're sinners. Who are we? What, 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 because we're saved? Somehow we've arrived? Idiosyncrasies and personality disorders are everywhere, even among believers. We're not gonna be perfect till he comes. So be careful because you and I have choices we make and that has to do with that loved one as well. Don't let that darkness continue to come into their lives and somehow begin to tolerate it and somehow begin to accept it because, well, they, you know, they're going through so much or something may be happening there. No, you come against the darkness. You're not coming against them. You're helping to free them. If you truly love them, you'll do everything into the kingdom of God, but don't go out horizontal toward them. Go in and up. Lord, show me, give me the wisdom I need to know what to say, what to do, and how to invoke your presence and your power to set them free because it's gotta be all you. I won't touch it, Lord. I'll stay away from it, but I'm gonna make my pleas, my proclamations, my declarations into the throne room, and I'm gonna trust you fully. And I'm gonna to agree together with my prayer warriors into opening the heart of that loved one to reach, to, to, to experience the light and the life 
of the perfect gospel of peace to shine in, to cleanse their spirits, Lord, from that sin, to eradicate the pain from their soul, and that the glow and the glory of God will shine out of them instead of the darkness pouring in. And when the glow and the glory of God pours in, the darkness must leave, and that will come through their eyes, their behavior, who they are, and you will be drawn to them, and they will be drawn to you. Your highest prayer, your highest intercession has to be for them to come back to the Christ, to be drawn to the Christ. No man cometh unto me, uh, unto the Father, except through me, as Jesus said in John 14, 6. So, finally, spiritual darkness refers to all that is in opposition to light, all of it. The light of God's love in Christ. The good news that Jesus brings to this world is that his light, his life, giving his life-giving spirit floods light and life into the spiritual darkness of the sinner's heart. The one who opened the eyes of the blind can also bring us out of the spiritual darkness. He's the only one, Christ. No matter how deep the darkness, don't ever forget this. The light of God's love and truth overcomes every sin that separates us from God. Every sin, everything, every time we haven't trusted him. <clears throat> even the sins of omission. He that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. That's the sin of omission. Everything that would separate us from God, the light of the glorious gospel, the light of the truth of the Holy Spirit will destroy all darkness, no matter how deep it is. Let's have a prayer to finalize our time together. Father God, we know now more than ever, this is extremely serious. It's extremely serious, first and foremost, with each one of us individually praying before you. We're invoking your presence to let your light, the light of your Holy Spirit, to scan every place in our soul and spirit. Oh God, especially the dark places. If there are any dark places, and there usually are, Lord, when you see that dark place, shine your light in, make it so clear. Bring about a spirit of repentance coming from godly sorrow that leads to that repentance. Remove all darkness of worldly sorrow that creates a sensation of death, that brings forth the depression and the disorders, the oppression that you came to set us free of, and to heal the broken hearts from the times of those who have abandoned us and forsaken us and betrayed us in the worst way, you came to do all of that. We're looking to you like never before. We're asking now on behalf of that loved one who's been in this darkness, they have no idea how to find their way out. They seem and appear maybe resistant to anything uh, that is um, a surrender about surrendering to you. We're asking that you would draw their hearts. Do what you need to do to come into their lives where your Holy Spirit just surrounds them and begins to pierce that place to draw their spirit. Let them see the Christ in you, in each one of us, the glow and the glory of God, because Jesus said, no man comes to me except the spirit of my Father draws him. Let them see the Holy Spirit of the Father draw them to him. And Lord, show me what I am to do and especially what I am not to do in my intercession, bringing that loved one to the throne of grace. I call him by name. I call her by name. I present them to your throne of grace to do whatever is necessary. I rebuke every foul spirit of deception, of lying, of, of darkness, of death that's over them. I bind those spirits. I rebuke them and cast them away from them, not to return. And in doing so, I'm asking you to reveal to this one in darkness, the place that allowed the darkness to come in and to surrender that place to you and ask forgiveness for not trusting you to come into that place where the darkness had taken over and bring forth that spirit of repentance such that they will not be finished in their brokenness before you, before you fill them with your light and life. We trust you for this, Lord, now and in the days ahead. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. If you have thoughts on this or comments, we love to see them. We're thankful for you being there. And remember, 
Walking Through Calvary. You'll find it on our webpage, restoringrelationships.org. We look forward to having you with us very soon on one of our Zooms. God bless you now. Bye-bye.